Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jackson Rudolph, and this is episode five, the funniest things I've seen at a karate tournament. Now, at the time that I'm recording this, we are just two days away from Christmas, so I wanted to spread some holiday cheer with this topic. Uh, We've been getting a lot into sport karate history and some more serious topics over the past several episodes, and so with this one, I wanted to lighten it up a little bit, do something fun, and talk about some of the funniest things that I've seen at a karate tournament. Now, before we get into that, there are a couple of things that might make this episode sound a little bit different. Uh, In one of my previous episodes, you might remember that I caught a cold when traveling to Toronto for that tournament. Um, Well, just this past week, I was actually in New Orleans, and it still gets cold down there, even though it's down south. I was in New New Orleans with my friends, the uh, the Fury family. Peyton Fury used to be a competitor on the ATA, very successful uh, bow staff competitor on that circuit. And so every year I do a bow fishing trip with them where we go down and we get a charter and we take an airboat out into the swamp. And it's one of my absolute favorite hobbies in the world is bow fishing. Basically what you're doing is you've got a bow and arrow with a fishing line tied to the end of your arrow. And you're going out on this airboat late at night and you're shining these lights down the water. You're looking for what's called redfish or red drum, one of the best eating fish that I've ever had in my life. And so what happens is you're looking around in the swamp for these fish and the water's only maybe, you know, three, four feet deep at most. And uh, when one of these redfish comes by, you see them like glow red down in the water from the light shining on it. And then you uh, you pull back your arrow and you fire a shot and then you try to reel it in. Uh, so it's one of my absolute favorite hobbies. But doing that for hours on end at nighttime in the winter gave me another little bit of a cold. So if you hear some sniffling and notice that my voice is a bit different, uh, it's from that bow fishing trip. And thank you to the Fury family for having me out once again and uh, and us getting to enjoy that time. Uh, Another thing you might notice is that it is raining outside right now. I don't know how that's going to affect the audio, if you guys are going to be able to hear that or not. But we'll see how it goes. Not ideal situations for the podcast this week, but I'm a man of the people. We're going to make it happen. And so now we're going to go ahead and get right on into our main discussion topic, which is the funniest things I've seen at a karate tournament. And I've split this up into three different categories. Uh, And the first category is funny because of just how random these things that happened were. And these are in no particular order. These are just kind of as I remember them. So one of the first ones is Brandon Osborne at the 2006 U.S. Open when he performed Kata Mickey Mouse. This was one of the funniest things. I was at the 2006 U.S. Open, but I don't remember watching this live. I only remember seeing it on the YouTube video, which I'm going to include a link to uh, down in the description. Uh, but basically, Brandon Osborne, this is DJ Neve. These, this is the guy that does like the OG that does all the all the good remixes for all the NASCA guys and, and other circuits as well. And I've used several of Brandon's remixes. He does a great job. And what he did at this U.S. Open was he went into the men's, uh, I want to say it was create, it was either creative or extreme forms, might have been musical, went into one of the open forms divisions up on stage uh, during the eliminations at U.S. Open. And he proceeds to take off his gi to reveal this like muscle shirt, like a t-shirt with like muscles spray painted on it like you would get like when you're on vacation. He's wearing one of those shirts and then he backs up and he hits like this deep horse stance and brings both hands up to his ears. So they make like, he's got both hands real big next to his head. And he goes, kata! Mickey Mouse and then he starts running this open form and he's got you know chop punches stance shifting all that but then he also throws in these performance moves like at one point in the form he simulates like a noogie and then he does a wedgie doing all this crazy stuff in the form it's absolutely hysterical to watch one of the most entertaining things that I've ever seen in a tournament and it completely came out of nowhere so Brandon Osborne kudos to you for having a a lasting impact on my memory uh, with Kata Mickey Mouse you guys definitely need to check out that video. Another one is another U.S. Open, and actually all, all three of these in the random category are from U.S. Open. I guess that just goes to show you the type of variety that you get at U.S. Open because it is the world's largest martial arts event, and it truly is an open tournament. Anybody can show up and compete, and that was the case with Breakdance Guy at the 2012 U.S. Open, and this was literally a dude that showed up. He was wearing like mat shoes and he had like a, a white hat on backwards, like, like a dancer, like a b-boy. And he literally goes out there and does a form that's maybe 
10 to 15 percent martial arts and like all of the rest is like break dancing he's like grabbing the tip of his hat he's doing all this footwork at one point he like gets on the ground and does like a whole bunch of different little break dance stuff um, i'm no dancing expert so i have no idea if it was even good break dancing or not you'd have to ask a guy like steve tirada uh, of quest crew for that also a former nasca competitor team paul mitchell member um but anyway it, it was hilariously entertaining because nobody expected it you know what i mean like i'm not saying that it was bad martial arts or bad breakdancing or anything like that. It wasn't funny because it was necessarily bad. It was funny because it was so random. Like, no one expected somebody to walk out there in the eliminations at U.S. Open in the men's division and just start breakdancing in their, in their form. Uh, so that's another very funny memory that I have, and I do remember watching that one live. And then the third in the random category is from the 20, it was either 2017 or 2018 U.S. Open. And this is actually a, a, a personal story. So for the past several years at U.S. Open, there has been this awesome dude that shows up. He's, he's kind of a middle-aged guy and he competes in the 18 plus division. He doesn't go compete in the 30 plus or anything like that. He competes in the 18 plus division and he competes in the, the open weapons divisions all of the past several years at U.S. Open. And the first year... I don't think he was even wearing like a uniform. The first year, I'm pretty sure he showed up in like black sweatpants and like a black t-shirt. And then I think he like got some gi pants the next year. And I think he now has like a, almost like a Kung Fu type top that he wears, uh, but very comfortable looking. Um, and he basically has this giant nunchuck, this single giant nunchuck that looked almost like he took two Eskrima sticks and like tied them together with a rope. And he just goes out there with this nunchuck and just, and just has a good time. Like you can tell he just goes out there and he's doing manipulations. He's doing strikes. He's doing spins, hand rolls, stuff like that. He's very skilled at what he does. It's got good flow to it. And he just goes out there and has a good time. That's not what's funny about him, though. I remember he's apparently uh, somebody that's been competing for a very long time, maybe just had this resurgence where he started showing up at U.S. Open again. Because I remember I was standing with Reed Presley. We were getting ready for one of our divisions at, uh, at this particular U.S. Open. Uh, and, and this other guy was warming up as well. And uh, he comes up to Reed and I. And we start having a little bit of small talk as we do with, with anybody in the division. And uh, we're talking to this guy. And I think it was the, it was creative weapons that was going at the time. So there wasn't any music. And, and this guy comes up to Reed and I, and he's like, so they don't allow any music in this division. And we're like, no, not in creative or extreme. They save all the music for the musical division. And then the guy responds like, oh man, you know, back in my day, we used to be able to use music whenever we wanted to. And then he delivers the line that will stay in my memory forever as one of the funniest lines that I've ever heard. He looks Reed and I right in the face and he goes, this ain't no disco, baby. <laughs> and then he just kind of laughs and like walks off and goes back to warming up. And the whole this ain't no disco, baby story is like one of my absolute favorite things. Not only do I love this guy because he genuinely like goes out and performs and just loves what he does while he's doing it. But the fact that we were just having small talk and he was talking about music and just drops that line, this ain't no disco, baby, is like one of the funniest things ever. Reed and I both loves that story. And so now we're going to move on into our next category, which is things that are funny only because they turned out okay. <laughs> so this is uh, stories of apparent injury that are only funny because the people that got injured turned out being perfectly fine. Uh, and actually, in none of these, I don't think anybody was actually injured injured. Uh, it's just kind of a, a scary moment that in retrospect was funny. Um, so the first one is one that most people that follow sport martial arts probably already know. And this one is the Josh Durbin double back attempts. Um, and this is, this is like a classic sport karate video where whoever posted it tells this story in the beginning of the video about how Josh Durbin promised that the first time that he made the nighttime finals that he would try a double back in his form. And Josh Durbin did exactly that. Now, this is not one that I was actually there to watch. This is one that I've only seen on YouTube. I think it was 2006 Bluegrass Nationals. It'll probably say in the, in the video that I put in the link down below. Uh, but it was Bluegrass Nationals, and Josh Durbin does his intro. He walks over to the corner of the stage, gets all hype, and he goes for this double back. Uh, but he, he opens up just a little bit too early and winds up. It's actually a very scary land. He lands kind of like on the back of his neck and on, on his shoulder. Um, but he got right up. He was fine. He wasn't dazed or anything. He actually went on and, and ran his form, ran the whole rest of his form. He was not hurt. But then he decides to come back up on stage after his form and do it again. So he's already under-rotated the first double back and 
landed almost landed straight on his head and then proceeds to come out and try the double back again. So this second attempt was actually closer. This time he kind of wound up landing on all fours. It wasn't as scary as the first landing. Um, but just the, the persistence has to be respected. The fact that he stood up and he was a man of his word has to be respected in the sense that he said the first time he got on stage he was going to try this regardless of how crazy it was, and then he actually tried it. Um, that takes a lot of intestinal fortitude. That takes some guts to be able to do. Um, so kudos to Josh Durbin for giving it a shot. Um, and it was a scary landing at the time, but if you go back and, and you watch the video and you hear the story, it is kind of funny, the, um, the attempt that was made. Now, another one is one that, that consists of absolutely zero apparent injury, and that is, that's what's so funny about it. So Cole Eckert was running, and unfortunately there's no video record of this, or else I would definitely put a link to it because I watched this live and it was hysterical. Cole Eckert was running a traditional bow form at the Lone Star Open one year. This, had, this, this was probably 10 years ago. I was still on uh, Team Change the Game. I was, not on, uh, I was not on Paul Mitchell yet. And... Uh, one of my teammates was Connor Griffith, and he was competing in this division against Colt Eckert. So Colt Eckert is running his traditional bow form, and he gets to the part of the form, like every traditional bow form has a swing combo at some point in the form. Typically, people do like a forehand, backhand, tuck it under the arm, spin around, swing again, and into the forward strike. So Cole's setting up for this combo, and he's a little bit, uh, I believe it was further to the left in the ring than he normally is. So he's kind of close to the edge of the ring. And he goes for this swing combo, and on that first massive forehand and Cole's a strong guy and this is like when they were in 14 17 so this is like a strong dude swinging this forehand as hard as he can and on the ending part of that forehand just as he's about to turn it over and swing back the other way all of the force of that forehand baseball swing pops Connor Griffith right in the head and Connor wasn't even looking at the form Connor's like looking a different direction and he just gets slammed in the head with this bow the bow breaks in half part of it flies off and what was so funny was Connor just turns his head as if somebody had tapped him on the shoulder. He's like, oh, what was that? Was that a fly? What was like, like Connor is just completely not concerned about the fact that he just got smacked over the head with a bow staff. Literally, the bow was broken over his head. And then he just turns around like, oh, what happened? <laughs> and he was not hurt in the slightest. And you can tell, obviously, that like, Cole was mortified because he just hit somebody and broke his bow. And so he, you know, he like kind of gasps and was like, what just happened? And then Connor's like, nah, it's good. And it was just hilarious to watch Connor just like get hit full strength with a bow and just kind of turn his head and be like, eh, whatever. <laughs> it was just so funny. And probably the reason that it didn't hurt that much was because of the fact that the bow broke. Kind of like when we're doing board breaking, right? If you break a board and you go through it, it doesn't really hurt that much. But if you're hitting a board as hard as you can and you don't break it, then that hurts you more. So I think it's kind of that situation where the fact that the bow broke took away some of that impact. Um, but nonetheless, it was hilarious to see Connor's reaction to that. And then the next one is, is a guy that unfortunately I don't know his name. And this is one that I only saw the tail end of it. But my mom was actually scorekeeping the division in which this happened. And she relayed the story to me. Um, and basically, um, in like I think I want to say it was the 40 plus division. And this dude at the U.S. Capitol Classics enters the weapons division with what appears to be a steak knife. Like he is going out to compete with a steak knife that it looks like he just pulled out of the kitchen. And, you know, he's doing his form and he's doing his thing, you know, stab here, slice, slice there. And then all of a sudden in the middle of this form, you just see blood. And it turns out that apparently this dude like accidentally sliced his hand open in the middle of this steak knife form that he was running. So the first funny part is the fact that some dude showed up to a karate tournament with a steak knife and was running a form. And then the other funny part about this is that like everybody just assumed that it wasn't a live blade. Like nobody competes with live blades. So everybody just assumed it was a prop. And so the fact that like he actually cut himself and was hurt, obviously the fact that he cut himself is not the funny part, but just how like surprising it was that it was a live blade and the fact that he was actually running a form with a steak knife, a real steak knife, that's what makes this funny. And then it actually became a situation where blood got all over the mat. The guy had to go, and I assume he probably had to get stitches because of how bad the cut was. Um, but I assume he's, he's okay. It wasn't anything like life-threatening or anything like that. It was just a cut on his hand. Um, but actually, blood was all over the mat. They had to shut down that mat for the rest of the tournament. They had to move that division to a different ring. And that was a whole debacle. Uh, but the funny part of that is just the fact that this dude just showed up to a karate tournament wanting to run a form with a steak knife. Uh, now, I know there are some traditional styles 
that use knives, like I know there's Kung Fu styles that use knives as an actual weapon, things like that, uh, butterfly knives, things like that. Um, but in this situation, it looked, it didn't look like a martial arts knife. It looked like a knife that like came straight out of his kitchen. Um, so anyway, so that was a, that was another funny one that my mom relayed to me after scorekeeping that division. Uh, and now we're going to go ahead and move on into one of our advertisements. Now, if you noticed in the episode last week, I completely forgot to do any advertisements. Um, and that's primarily because, you know, the advertisements are, are just a couple of, of my own things that I promote like right now, like the flow system uh, and like the Century Signature Series weapons. Uh, but in the future, I would like to be able to advertise other things on the show. So if anybody has a product or if you have a team or a tournament, coming up that you would like me to mention. Uh, I don't really know how I'm going to do it yet, what the incentive is going to be, that type of thing. I got to get that figured out. Uh, but if you do want some type of advertisement to go up in the show, uh, feel free to shoot me a message and we can start getting those wheels moving. Uh, but anyway, this one is for the flow system. The, the, the flow system is a one of a kind weapons training system that I founded in coordination with the Martial Arts Industry Association. It features a complete bow staff program taught by yours truly, as well as a complete comma curriculum taught by world champion and fellow team Paul Mitchell member Mackenzie Emery and there's a couple of really cool features ranging from instructor training to an interactive Facebook group that constantly uploads bonus content and answers questions uh, to those of you that are using the flow system. Uh, so thank you to anybody that participated in our Black Friday sale and signed up for the flow system there. If you want more details feel free to shoot me a message or visit the flow system uh, TV today. And so now we're moving back into our third category of some of the funniest things that I've seen at a karate tournament. And this one is my favorite category because these ones are funny because of how awesome they were. One of the first ones that comes to mind is one of my favorite introductions that I have ever heard. And that comes from none other than Ross Levine. Now, you guys know from listening to the podcast, I'm a huge Ross Levine fan. I think he was extremely influential to a lot of the modern bow tricks that you've seen developed today, especially body rolls. Uh, I, I consider him to be a top five fighter of all time. Uh, and again, I was in the era that was watching Ross in his prime, so that impacts that as well. Uh, he's been killing it in glory kickboxing, so I, I, will, I will shout the praises of Ross Levine for a long, long time. But one of my favorite things about Ross was this intro that he would do for his bow form. And I couldn't locate a video that included the intro because most of the time, uh, like sport martial arts videos start from when the competitor actually kind of backs up after they've said their intro. Because typically there's nothing too exciting said in the intro. It's just, judges, my name is so-and-so, I represent so-and-so, blah, 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 right? Ross had an intro in which he would walk up and he would introduce his bow form as, judges, my name is Ross Levine. My form has no flips, no tricks, and no throws. Just bow. And to me, that was just like the coolest thing ever. So like he, he addresses the fact that he doesn't do any flips. So he's going to go out there and he's going to win with just the weapons form. And actually, I might be misquoting here. He either says no flips, no tricks, and no throws, just bow. Or he says no flips, no kicks, and no throws, just bow. I'm not sure which one that is. Ross, if you hear this in the comments, go ahead and clear it up for us. I don't remember if it was tricks or kicks on that second one. Um, but either way, he's clarifying the fact that not only is he not going to flip, he's also not going to do any kicking or any aerial kicking of any kind. He's not even going to throw his bow in the air, which is a dominant part of modern competition. And even back when Ross was competing, he was competing against Kalman, Matt, guys that were releasing their weapons. And Ross was finding success against those competitors sometimes. And he just came out and said, I'm not going to do any throws either. I'm just going to run a bow form and I'm going to try to win that way. And to me, that was it, it's funny because of how creative it is. But it's funny because of how awesome it is. Like, I just, I love everything about that introduction. Another thing that I saw that was funny because it was awesome was Raymond Daniels at Battle of Atlanta. This was one of the years, I think there were like two years that Battle of Atlanta did like a $5,000 open weight grand prize for the point fighting. Uh, and I believe this is like in like the first or second round in one of those years, because when you're offering a $5,000 prize, I mean, the, the competition pool is going to be huge. Everybody's going to enter just to have a chance to try to win that, right? And unfortunately, that means that sometimes you will get some really, really good fighters, such as one of the greatest fighters of all time, Raymond Daniels, against somebody that's probably not ready to fight Raymond Daniels. Um, and that leads me to this story where Raymond knew that he was much better than this fighter that he was fighting. I do not know which fighter it was that he was fighting. I assume it was a local competitor that may or may not even compete anymore. I do not know who this other fighter was. But Raymond Daniels was fighting this guy, and it was obviously a, a mismatch. 
And one of the funniest and most impressive things that I've ever seen done in a point fight is Raymond's fighting on stage. He was, if you're, if you're facing the stage, Raymond is the left side fighter. He's fighting with his left leg in front. So his whole body is facing the crowd. And Raymond's kind of bouncing and, you know, waiting for this guy to do something. And the guy's not doing anything. And so Raymond just looks at the crowd, ma- maintains eye contact with the crowd, does not even look at the other fighter and blitzes and scores on a blitz without even having to look at the other fighter. And it was funny just because of how impressive it was. Like Raymond literally maintained eye contact with the audience and just went straight into a blitz and scored a point on this poor guy without even having to look at him. That is funny because that is awesome on the part of Raymond Daniels. Now, some people would argue that that is showboating and that you know you shouldn't disrespect or humiliate another competitor, that type of thing. Me personally, I would never do what Raymond did in that fight. I agree that it was maybe a little bit disrespectful, uh, but sometimes when things are a little bit disrespectful, that's when they can be a little bit funny too. So I do not cond- condone disrespecting your opponent, but in this case, it was, uh, it was very impressive that Raymond pulled that off. The next one, Jeff Doss doing hand puppets during his intergalactic form. So the song intergalactic, the rap song uh, by the Beastie Boys. Jeff Doss had this form that he would do to that song. And it's anybody that knows Jeff Doss, anybody that has seen Jeff Doss do forms has probably seen Jeff Doss start his form this way. It's one of the most creative introductions to a form that I've ever seen. And it's funny because it is awesome. So literally, there's this part in inter- at the very beginning of Intergalactic where there's like these kind of uh, techno sounding, like that kind of sound. I know that that was horrible. I'm completely tone deaf, so don't judge me for my attempt at, at imitating that sound. But it makes this very particular sound. And what Jeff does is, is Jeff like takes his hands out and he basically like makes two hand puppets and he uses these beats as the hand puppets like talk back and forth to each other in some type of like this, uh, this imaginary altercation between these hand puppets. And then the little interaction ends with one hand puppet like opening up and then attacking the other one before Jeff goes on into his form. That's awesome. And then later on at the form, one particular form that I'll put in the link below has both of these things. Sometimes he would just do one or the other but the form that I link below has both of these things in the same form. And then when he would get to the end of the form, he would do a people's elbow, like the wrestling move, like, like the whole like lick the knuckles and then like tap the elbow and then drop your whole body down and drop an elbow on somebody. He would end his form with the people's elbow. That is epic. Like, that's awesome to end your form with a people's elbow. That's legendary. So Jeff Doss, the two elements of that form, very creative and very funny, but funny because of how awesome it was. Like the idea of these two hand puppets arguing back and forth, then one attacking the other and then dropping the people's elbow on whoever you were fighting at the end of the form. That is awesome. Congratulations, Jeff Doss for being creative and having some awesome creative stuff in your form. And now to probably the funniest thing that I have ever seen at a karate tournament. And again, this is still funny because it is awesome. And that is Vince Johnson at French Open 5. Now, if you go back and you watch videos from French Open 5, there are so many videos. Like, I have studied hours of French Open 5 videos because of how awesome the French Open was in its prime. Unfortunately, it's not a tournament anymore, but if French Open became a tournament once again, I would absolutely be there because the videos that you see from French Open are insane. All, all of the best American competitors and then some throwing down. You had Matt Emig, you had Mark Canalizado, you had Marcel Jones, you had Steve Tirada. You had so many great competitors that would go to French Open and just do all their craziest stuff. They, they would just do everything. They would just throw every trick that they knew how to do and they would just try to do the coolest form that they possibly could. Like people have made samplers off of just the videos from French Open 5 before. Uh, So Vince Johnson, I believe he was on Straight Up at the time. Yes. Or Vince may have always been on Straight Up. Anyway, so Vince Johnson goes out there to run the weapons division at the French Open. And he's doing a comma form. And he comes out wearing a hakama and his guitar. Now, I don't know how many times you've seen a hakama in a comma form, in an open comma form, somebody wearing a hakama. So that was the first thing that Vince Johnson did. He comes out in a hakama. And then what he does is... He's not holding any commas in his hand at the time. He does his walk in and gets to like this, the back center of the ring. And then he kneels down in like a, a traditional kneeling position. 
At which point, Marcel Jones comes up behind Vince Johnson and ties like a uh, like a Karate Kid headband on Vince Johnson's head. While Marcel Jones is tying this headband on Vince Johnson, Vince takes both of his hands and raises them dramatically to his sides. And then what appears to be in the video, I think it's Mark Cannonizzato and Matt Immig, basically do aerials in from the side of the ring and place Vince's commas in his hands. So you literally have three all-time great martial arts competitors just being part of the theatrics of this form. Like you have Marcel Jones, probably the best creative forms competitor ever, tying on this headband. And then you have Matt Emig and Mark Cannonizzato, who basically there was an entire era of men's CMX forms competition in which Matt and Mark were going back and forth. You have Matt and Mark Cannonizzato bring out the commas to Vince and the form hasn't even started yet. At this point, Vince is also shirtless. So he's taken off his gi top. And by the time that Marcel and Matt and Mark have done their thing, Vince is now shirtless in a hakama with a headband and commas in his hands. So before he's even done any martial arts, this is already like one of the most epic things and one of the funniest things that has ever happened at a martial arts tournament. And then he proceeds to just go off. Like he starts this comma form, fast cuts, all kinds of creative stuff. He does like a, a like a fancy knee slide. He does like a, a double spin where he's got his hands on his hips and the hakam is flying everywhere. He just went off and, and it was awesome. The crowd was going crazy. The energy was incredible. And the confidence level that it takes to go and run an open comma form in a hakama with a headband shirtless in France is unbelievable. Like, I don't think that any competitor has ever had that level of confidence when they're running a form. So congratulations to Vince Johnson for doing one of the most epic things that I've ever seen at a tournament, doing one of the funniest things that I've ever seen at a tournament, and probably being the most confident competitor to ever enter the field of competition. Vince Johnson, that French Open 5 form is awesome. Now, since I have been talking so much about funny things that I have seen from other people, whether they just be random, whether I think they're awesome, whether it's, you know, apparent uh, injuries where people turn out to be okay, it is only fair that I tell one of my personal funny stories in which I did something that was embarrassing and funny all at the same time. And this came at the Diamond Nationals my last year as a junior. So my last year as a junior competitor, um, I had won three consecutive diamond rings. So I, my goal was to go through 14 to 17 and win the weapons diamond ring 14 to 17 every single year that I was there. And the first three times I had won the diamond ring with CMX weapons. And so we get to this diamond nationals my last year as a junior, I make it into the runoff and Jackson decides that even though he hasn't done it in competition before, that he's going to go ahead and unveil his triple spin in runoffs. Now granted, I won the other three diamond rings without doing a triple spin. I might not have needed to do that triple spin, but for some reason that day, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do the triple spin. And now, like in present day, we see triple spin as like a commodity, right? Like everybody in 14, 15, 16, 17 seems like, or all the top competitors at least, seem like they can all do triple spins. People are doing four, five, six spins in warmups. Kids are crazy right now. Uh, but back, you know, four or five years ago, a triple spin was like very, very rare. Like you didn't see it and you certainly didn't see it done in competition, right? But I decided I was going to go for it in runoffs and I was going to do it at the end of my form. Now, one thing that you guys might notice about my current forms when I do throw triple is that I typically do it in the first section because trying to spin your body around three times, have enough time to see the bow, catch the bow cleanly, land on the knee and then hit a pose and sell it. That takes a lot of energy to do that technique. It's probably one of the most energy expensive moves in my forms. However, in this Diamond Nationals, I decided to do this move at the end of my form when my energy is at its lowest. So I go ahead and I set up this triple and I also decided to do this triple after I had already done a two and a half. So the plan was to do two spins, catch the bow behind my back or do a two and a half spin or a 900 and then whip out of that and then go immediately into the triple spin. Not my brightest of ideas. And so I go into this triple spin, I get the first two spins done, and in the middle of that third spin, my left leg just slips right out from under me and I land flat on my butt. The impressive part about this is that despite the fact that I did like the last 180 degrees of rotation on my butt, I actually still caught my bow. Like I caught my bow on my butt, but obviously I had fell down and everybody knew that I had fallen down and I did like some awkward, ugly front sweep to get out of it and tried to make it look like that's what I meant to do. 
but it was really just not at all what I meant to do, and that was really bad. Fortunately, the story does have a happy ending because I did win the traditional weapons runoff earlier, and then I wound up winning the fourth consecutive diamond ring with a traditional weapons form. Uh, so all, all's well that ends well, but the funny part was in that runoff, me deciding to do a triple just because I felt like it, and then falling on my butt and embarrassing myself and thinking that my run for a fourth consecutive diamond ring was over, but it all turned out okay because I won traditional anyway. So... Moving on. So that does it for our main discussion topic. Uh, and now we're going to go ahead and move on into story time, which is our next major segment here. And story time is actually somewhat related to that first uh, embarrassing story that I just told you. And this story time is titled, Always Listen to Mom. And so for this particular story, 2011 was kind of my, my breakout year as a competitor. I had won the U.S. Open in 2010. Uh, I won an overall grands at Compete Nationals in 2010. Uh, but those were kind of the only two big things that I achieved that year. And in 2011, I think I won uh, like the first seven tournaments in a row. I wound up winning like 10 out of 12 tournaments. I had a really, really good 2011 season. So the first tournament was AKA Warrior Cup. And I win the overall which was part of that streak of like seven tournaments that I won. It started that streak. And so I win the overall, and this was in the junior. So the format for the Warrior Cup, it was, you win the overall, and I was in 13 and under at the time. So you win the overall for the 13 and under weapons, and then you compete against the winner of the 14 to 17 weapons to see who gets the junior weapons Warrior Cup. So in this particular instance, uh, I was going to be up against one of my teammates, Michaela Johnson. Uh, Michaela Johnson and I were teammates both on the Premier Martial Arts National Karate Team, which was the first team that I competed on, and then that team became Team Change the Game, uh, which Michaela and I were both on. Uh, Michaela is an extremely talented comic competitor, innovated a ton of comic tricks that we still see done in competition today. I have a ton of respect for Michaela. And because I had so much respect for Michaela, I decided that I needed to upgrade my form going into the Warrior Cup round. And so, kind of like I said in the previous story about how the triple spin was kind of unheard of when I did the triple spin and that runoff and fell on my butt, at this time, at this Warrior Cup in 2011, two and a half spins were unheard of. I, I'm, I believe that I was the first person to ever do a two and a half spin with a bow in a form. So throw the bow up, spin twice, catch it behind the back. I believe I was the first person to do that. Um, if somebody else knows of somebody else that did it uh, pre-2011, let me know. But I'm pretty sure I was the first person to do that. Either way, the first time that I tried it was in the Warrior Cup final in 2011. And before I went on stage to run that form, my mom looked at me and she said, Jackson, don't change anything. Just go out there and run your form and hope for the best. Go out there and run your form. Hope for the best. Don't change anything. And my dad and I were like, you know, I think I need something else. Michaela's really, really good. I need to try this, right? Um, and so I go into the form. I was going first. Uh, I run the form. I get to the very, very end. I don't know what my deal is with trying the hardest moves in my form at the very, very end. Uh, but I get to the very, very end. I try the 900, the two and a half spin catch behind the back, and I drop. And my chance of winning a Warrior Cup uh, just went away. Now, I did wind up coming back in 2012 and being able to win the Warrior Cup and redeem myself. Uh, but in 2011, I did not listen to my mom, and I dropped and I lost the Warrior Cup. Now granted, I may have hit that form and still lost to Michaela. who knows, right? But the number one thing is, is that my mom told me to do something, I didn't listen to my mom, I went up there and dropped, and I lost even having a chance of winning that Warrior Cup. So the moral of the story for any kids listening to this is, if your mom has a feeling about a form, trust her. My mom is not a black belt. My mom has never thrown a punch. My mom has never thrown a kick. My mom has never picked up a bow staff. She does not know anything about martial arts other than what she has watched for years and years. However, it goes to show that she is almost always right when it, comes about, when it comes to martial arts decisions. I didn't listen to my mom, I dropped, and I lost an opportunity at having my first Warrior Cup in 2011, so instead I had to wait until 2012 to win my first one. So that is the story time for this week. Uh, now moving on into our second advertisement and final advertisement, which is for Century Signature Weapons. Myself, Jax Rudolph, Mackenzie Emery, and Danny Etkin all have signature weapons lines of bow staffs, uh, commas, and trucks, respectively. Uh, each of us tried to design our weapons to be the exact same specs that we use in competition that helped us become world champions, uh, and we highly recommend those weapons. All three of us stand behind our weapons and the quality of those Century Signature Weapons. Uh, so if you want to check out those 
signature weapons, go ahead and head on over to CenturyMartialArts.com and search any of our names in the search bar to check out the Century Signature Series weapons by those three members of Team Paul Mitchell. So now moving on into tournament talk, uh, instead of talking about a tournament because we just kind of finished the NASCAR season, there's no NASCAR tournaments to talk about right now uh, because that's the primary circuit that I compete on and the primary tournaments that I talk about. Um, instead, we're actually going to use tournament talk to talk about a couple of camps that I'm very excited about uh, that are going to be coming up uh, right here right after Christmas. So the first one that I'm going to be teaching at is the TCK Winter Camp hosted by none other than the legendary Johnny Tension. This is going to be December 26th to 29th in New York. Uh, for fighters, it is an absolutely star-studded lineup of fighters. You have Raymond Daniels, Ross Levine, Jesse Ray, Tyreek Saint, Bailey Murphy, Roman Brundle, Elijah Everill. You have an absolutely incredible lineup of fighting instructors that anybody that wants to be good at sparring should absolutely show up and take advantage of that. On the form side, you also have myself covering the bow staff, Joey Castro for traditional forms, Cole Presley on the commas, and Rashad Eugene, who's one of the most creative competitors on the circuit right now. Had a break, uh, Rashad just had a breakout season this year. I think he was... Uh, actually made the nighttime finals, was on stage at most of the tournaments that he attended this year. So congratulations to Rashad on an awesome season. Um, and so on the forms and weapons side, we've got a great lineup of instructors there as well. And the other cool thing that Jody does with this event is he actually has special events that happen each night for the students at the camp. So like I think one night they're doing a movie night where we're going out to see Star Wars, that type of thing. Uh, Jody just does a really, really good job of putting together a great camp, and that is the TCK Winter Camp. I believe that spots are sold out for this year. You'd have to contact Jody to find out if you want to make a last-second trip. Uh, but definitely check that out for next year. Uh, and that brings me down to the second camp that I'm excited about that I'm going to be teaching at, and that is the Competitive Edge Winter Camp in Lebanon, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. This is from December 27th to the 29th, so me and Cole are actually teaching TCK Winter Camp on the 26th and 27th, hopping on a plane the 27th, flying to Nashville to teach CE Winter Camp, Competitive Edge Winter Camp, alongside Reed Presley, Jake Presley, and Mackenzie Emery. So that is going to be an awesome, awesome, awesome forms and weapons camp, working on all all of the weapons, working on tricking, working on performance, everything that you need to take your forms and weapons game to the next level, we will be covering it at Competitive Edge Camp. Uh, we do still have some spots open, so if you want to make a last minute trip to Nashville right here after Christmas, again that's December 27th to 29th, you can register at myuventex.com. And another special feature of Competitive Edge Winter Camp is that we actually have a special advanced training session on Sunday the 29th. So if you're a little bit crunched for time, maybe you can't make the 27th, 28th, but you want some advanced training, you can choose to register for just the advanced session on the 29th and this is tailored training specific to some of the hardest moves that that us as instructors don't get to cover in our general seminar because you have you know kids and students of very different skill levels so you have to cover the basics and some of the advanced but you never get through the high high level stuff and so the special advanced training session on Sunday the 29th at Competitive Edge Camp is designed to get to some of these harder, more difficult tricks that you're going to need if you want to be one of the best competitors in the world. And that concludes tournament talk for this week. And so the last thing that I want to mention is what next week's topic is. So the next episode is going to be a question and answer session featuring myself. We will do Q&A sessions with guests in the future. I'm going to start doing interviews in 2020. We have some awesome interviews lined up already uh, that I'm not going to spoil yet. I'll be sure to go ahead and tell you guys about that as they as they become finalized. Um, so next week's topic is a Q&A, and I'm going to be answering any questions that you want to ask about myself, my life experiences, martial arts, uh, school, tournaments, competing, anything under the sun that you want to ask me about is fair game. Uh, so next week's topic is Q&A. You can submit those questions on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Podbean via a direct message or a post or a comment on this particular podcast. Uh, if you do make a public post or a comment, be sure to use hashtag AskJRP. A-S-K-J-R-P, hashtag AskJRP, standing for the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. Uh, be sure to add that hashtag to make sure that I see the question that you are submitting. And that's going to be our main discussion topic for next week is addressing some of those questions. I can't promise that I'll get to everybody, uh, but if you include the hashtag, your chance of getting featured goes up significantly. Also, I don't have to mention your name if you want to ask an anonymous question. Just be sure that you say so when you submit the question uh, to me on one of those social media platforms, and I'll be sure to not, uh, not say your name on the show. But if you do want to be featured on the show, if you do want me to say your name with your question, uh, then you can go ahead and make that known as well. 
So next week's topic is going to be a question and answer session. I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited to see what topics, what questions you guys come up with. And be sure to comment down below, make a post, shoot me a message so we can make that happen. Once again, for our main discussion today on the uh, the funniest things that I've seen at martial arts tournaments, uh, some of the links to some of those videos that were available will be down in the description below. So feel free to check those out. I hope that everybody has a very happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Can't wait to get back on this podcast and talk to you guys next week. Everybody have a blessed week. Uh, This is Jackson Rudolph signing off for the Jackson Rudolph podcast, episode five.